uh, hi, thank you very much for coming for the uh, Paul Nalbaz program. Thank you for agreeing to give this interview. My pleasure. Uh, for our, for those of you who might know Browder, even though it's, it's close to impossible, but anyway, you have to know that uh, William Browder is a famous uh, American and British uh, uh, economist and financier. He is the CEO of the Heritage Capital Management. He worked for quite a while in Russia until he was denied visa and uh, Russians uh, tried to get uh, to steal his business and stole part of it. He's also very well known as head of the uh, global uh, Magnitsky campaign. Uh, once again, you know, go and check on the New Times website wrote about that time and again. Uh, Sergei Magnitsky was an accountant and a lawyer with Bill Browder's company in Moscow. And he was jailed, tortured, and finally basically killed in uh, Matroska Tishina prison in Moscow. And now Bill Browder became known once again as he is for his fight to help Ukraine in its war against uh, Russian full-scale aggression. Bill Brown, thank you very much again for uh, agreeing for this interview. You just returned back from uh, World Economic Forum in Davos. And there or on the, uh, at Davos, you spoke in favor of transferring $300 billion of frozen Russian money to Ukraine. Question. Who owes this money? Well, so um, just to give you a little bit more background, uh, after Putin invaded Ukraine um, about oh, in February 2022, um, one of the first things that the Western countries did was they froze the central bank reserves of Russia um, that were held in the West. And, and at the time, Russia had about $650 billion of central bank reserves and somewhere around 350 billion of those reserves, nobody knows the exact amount, <clears throat> was held in Western central banks. So in, in the US Federal Reserve, the uh, Bank of England, uh, European Central Bank, et cetera. So this number is was frozen about somewhere between 300 and 350 billion. And, um, and so then Putin carried on with his war. Uh, and of course, we've all seen these horrifying images of bombing, of infrastructure, of killing civilians, Moria Pol, the, the um, uh, uh, Bucha, all this kind of stuff. And as time has gone on, the amount of damage that Putin has inflicted on Ukraine, um, some estimate to be north of a trillion dollars. And so as we're watching this whole injustice unfold, um, here we have this situation where um, the West is holding this money frozen. And it seemed to me pretty obvious that, that uh, if Russia did the damage to Ukraine, Russia should pay for the damage. And one of the best ways to get Russia to pay for the damage <clears throat> is to confiscate this money. And so it's pretty, pretty much um, since the beginning of the war, I've been on a mission to try to get this money confiscated and handed over to Ukraine. And at first the, the conversation was, was very um, difficult. Most people in Western governments wanted nothing to do with it. It was, it was unconventional. It was not a normal uh, thing. Um, but as time has gone on and the pressure on Ukraine has increased and the financial pressure on the West has increased, and now we're starting to see certain uh, countries balking at giving Ukraine any money at all, uh, it's now focused everybody's mind that there's a way of solving these financial pressures on the West, and that is to confiscate the money. And so I think the probability now, um, two years after the war has started, of confiscating the money is probably much, much higher than it was when I first started talking about it. When you say probability, you mean, what, 10%, 20%, you know, 30%? What are odds? Well, it's kind of uh, the, the way I would characterize it. It's, it's very much like the conversations that, that surrounded um, handing over tanks or long-range missiles or even F-16s um, 
uh, to Ukraine. In my, in my mind, the probability is probably 90% that this money will be handed over. It's just a, uh, a question of when. And, and that, that I can't answer because it requires a lot of different people to make a, a consensus decision. This is a, um, uh, a decision that, that can't be made by just one country. It can't be the United States confiscates the money and Europe doesn't, or um, the UK does and, and Japan doesn't. Every, everybody has to do it together because if they don't do it together, then it creates a risk that people uh, will view certain countries as being more risky to hold money in um, than other countries. If everybody does it together, then nobody can be more risky than anyone else because everyone has acted in unison. So what was the reaction of the Davos crowd, and that's very influent crowd, uh, to your proposal? Well, the, the Davos crowd, um, uh, well, I mean, Davos has got a lot of different types of people. Many of them are irrelevant to this conversation, but the important people in the Davos crowd were the foreign ministers of various countries. I met with uh, the new Polish foreign minister, Radek Sikorski, um, the Lithuanian foreign minister, Gabrielis Lendis Burgess. Um, <clears throat> I met with the Czech foreign minister, Jan Lepavsky, and they're all like absolutely fully 100% in favor of this. Um, and then if you talk to just regular people um, in the Davos crowd, um, it's kind of an obvious thing. <laughs> why, 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 would, why would anyone be against confiscating Putin's money to pay for the damage Putin did? The people who are against this um, are not necessarily the people floating around Davos. The people who are against this um, are uh, people who are the um, governors of different central banks. In their, in their mind, uh, it's... it's a risky thing to do because it hasn't been done before. And, and their job is to have currency stability and interest rate and inflate and price stability. And so anything that could, anything that's sort of out, uh, eccentric, out of the ordinary um, novel is something that they don't really wanna do. Um, and then you have the, the problem uh, within the European Union. Um, the European Union is, is of course a um, co collection of countries. There's 27 member states. And this is the kind of decision that would re require um, unanimity within the European Union. You'd have to have each country agreeing to do it. And that's where you run into problems because uh, Putin has figured out the European Union a long time ago, and he has found ways of influencing cer certain small member states to effectively have a blocking veto. And um, he's been very successful at, um, at um, influencing Viktor Orban of Hungary. And more recently, um, he's had a little um, windfall with the um, election of uh, Fico, the um, prime minister of Slovakia, who's also pro-Putin, anti-Ukraine. And so you end up in a situation in Europe where um, rational things don't happen. What happens is they're all sort of focused with, between themselves and um, Europe is probably the, the complicating factor in any discussion about confiscating the money. So to make it clear, we're talking about money which are in U.S. dollars and in euros. Is that right? So it's money that's in U.S. dollars, in euros, in British pounds, Japanese yen, Swiss francs. Um, I don't think the... But the majority of money are in U.S. dollars. It no, the, the, the majority of the money, interestingly are in euros, and not just in euros. Um, the majority of the money is held in Euroclear. Euroclear is a place, is, an, is a financial institution which basically settles um, bond tra transactions. It, if you own a bond, a European bond, um, it will be held in custody at Euroclear, and they're the ones who um, basically offer the custody and offer the, you know, the payments. And so Euroclear is located in Belgium, <clears throat> and as far as I'm aware, somewhere, somewhere around $220 billion worth of euros, um, so a little bit, so let's say 200 billion euros, um, are, are held at Euroclear, are frozen at Euroclear in Belgium. And so, um, of course, you have the people from Euroclear who are all screaming bloody murder because they, they don't want to be in the middle of this whole thing. <laughs> and then you also have... Um, the Belgians, which Belgium is not known for its, you know, sort of leadership and and um, outspoken foreign policy, um, and so 
anything that happens in in um, uh, in Belgium and happens at Euroclear is is pretty much going to have to happen um, by a, an EU decision. And of course, as I mentioned, the EU has got this this framework of decision dysfunctional decision making because of these hijackers like Hungary and Slovakia. So that that's where the the problem lies. Now it's it may be. It it's sort of sounds worse than it is. We, we've seen these types of things before. Um, you know, the Germans, for example, never wanted to provide any weapons at all. In fact, the Germans were so averse to weapons for Ukraine that at one of the very first arms shipments from the UK to Ukraine, when the war started, uh, the Germans wouldn't even allow the um, British uh, military transport to go over German airspace. And then eventually Germany was providing leopard tanks and so on. And so uh, it's it's a um, it's really hard to predict the timing and and the intricacies of this negotiation. And I'm not in the room uh, watching it, but what I can say is that there's the, the main thing that's going to drive this process is financial necessity. Um, there's no reason why uh, European taxpayers and British taxpayers and American taxpayers should. Uh, dig into their own pockets before we confiscate the money that belongs to Putin. Okay, but what are the legal grounds for such a confiscation? Well, there, there's there's two different legal issues here, all right, C conflicting legal issues. The Russians would claim that all of their money is protected because the money belongs to the state and the state is, uh, whatever assets that belong to the state are protected by a legal concept called sovereign immunity. So for example, if you have an embassy in a country, um, that's the sovereign territory of Russia, even if it's in a foreign country and you can't do anything with that embassy. The same principle, legal principle applies to uh, Russian central bank reserves. And so the Russians are sort of folding their arms and saying, well, you can't touch it, we're protected by law. Now on the other side, there's another law which says that if one, in, if one country in the world um, inflicts damage to another country in the world, um, then the country inflicting the damage owes the money to the country that was the victim through something called the law and countermeasures. And, um, and there's a very clear legal case in which Ukraine has, has the right to make a, a claim against Russia using the law and countermeasures. And so this is where the lawyers get involved. So the lawyers say, if you, so if you're a prime minister of a country, let's say you're the British prime minister and you consult your legal advisor and you say, um, can we seize this money? Your legal advisor would say, no, of course not. It's, it's, um, we can't seize it because of, of um, sovereign immunity. However, if you ask a different question as the prime minister of the UK, and you say, um, how do we seize this money? Well, the lawyer would say, well, the way we seize the money is we use the law and countermeasures. Um, and then the question is, which law prevails, law and countermeasures or, or sovereign immunity? And the best way to be specific about this law and countermeasures. What do you mean so, exactly? So the law and countermeasures means that Ukraine has the legal right to make to to confiscate the money. It's it's as simple as that. It's it's an existing international legal concept, and every Every legal scholar who's looked at this will point to the law and countermeasures as a way in which it can be done. So then, then the question is, well, which law prevails? Which law do you count on? Sovereign immunity or countermeasures? And, and here's where it gets interesting, which, which is that there, there are many times in life where there are two different legal rights that conflict. And then in those situations, one of two things has to happen. Either a court has to make a decision to say that the one law prevails over the other, or if the, there's uh, confusion or arbitrariness about conflicting laws, then you need a, a new legal framework in which to define which law is more important. And so, for example, right now, <clears throat> literally as we speak today, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee is meeting <clears throat> to have what they call the markup, which is, which is where they evaluate a proposed law, and the markup that they're doing is on a law called the Repo Act, R-E-P-O. And the Repo Act is a specific piece of legislation um, drawn up specifically to address the point of confiscating uh, Russian assets that are held in the United States. And so 
when, <clears throat> when this legislation passes, which I think it will, um, then there will be a legal framework in the United States, which makes it clear, uh, unambiguous, um, that you can confiscate the assets based on US law. And it may be very necessary that similar laws or regulations are put in place in other countries so that there's no legal ambiguity once the money has been confiscated. Now, on the legal side, there are some people who would then say, well, uh, I don't believe that. that. That's just a bad legal analysis. <clears throat> and Russia will have uh, legal claims. Then the question is, where would Russia, if they had legal claims, where would they exercise those legal claims? Um, Russia couldn't exercise those legal claims at the International Court of Justice because Russia has refused to be a part of that uh, mechanism. So then it doesn't leave many opportunities other than Russia going to the national courts in the countries where the money has been confiscated. But if in those countries, um, the legal uh, framework, the laws have been passed to make it legal, then Russia doesn't have a claim at all. And so I don't think that there is um, such a complicated legal route to doing this. I think this is more of a political issue than a legal issue. And my prediction is that it will happen. Russian Central Bank, at least on paper, is an independent entity. So there will be another collision, you know, uh, 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 attorneys on the Russian side would say, you know, this is central bank money. Central bank is independent from the Russian state. It is Russian state who started mm -hmm. the war, not the central bank of Russia. Well, they can make that claim, let's say, in a New York court in the Southern District of New York, and let's see how the judge <laughs> how the judge looks at it. I don't think that, that they would have a very favorable um, hearing, but, um, you know, I, I'm sure that they'll make all sorts of uh, legal claims once this happens. And so it's got to be watertight before it's put in place, but that's, what, that's why it hasn't happened already. But aren't you concerned that these might create a very... I would say unfortunate precedent that some state today, you know, you are talking, you know, on the side of good people, but say tomorrow bad people from the bad state will come and say, you know, I want your money. I'm going to confiscate this money. Well, it, it, this is the, this, the, the very logical reason why people don't keep their money in China. They don't keep their money in Iran. Uh, they don't keep their money in Saudi Arabia, because these are all countries that will confiscate your money um, very easily. It's not as if the U.S. Federal Reserve keeps rubles on deposit at the Russian, at the Central Bank of Russia. And so, but there, there is a, a very important part of your question, which is that it will have a deterrent effect on other countries. Because imagine that you're China, you've just seen Russia lose their half of their central bank reserves and because of this <clears throat> war that they started. And China is a country that keeps a lot of hard currency in foreign countries. Um, if you were China and you saw this happening, would you wanna go and invade Taiwan knowing that there is a real chance that you could lose a significant portion of your foreign exchange reserves? And I would argue that, that you probably wouldn't. Um, and, and that's <clears throat> potentially even more valuable than, than, than the money being confiscated right now. If to, to deter uh, a Chinese invasion of Taiwan is, is of immense value in the world. You didn't answer my previous question about, you know, the independence or, you know, so-called independence of the uh, Russian Central Bank. Any court, you know, any, Europe, any Western court would say, this is a central bank. It's in the bank from the Russian government. It is was Putin and his government which started this whole full, uh, full scale inv invasion in Ukraine. And Elvira Nobiulina, the head of the central bank, uh, didn't uh, wasn't the one who sent tanks or sent weapons to Ukraine. What will be um, your response to that? My, my response is that that that, that is a. Um... <clears throat> A distinction that's not even worth making. The Russian central bank is fully under the control of Vladimir Putin. It's 100% owned by the Russian state. Um, uh, her job is is uh, is uh, organized by Vladimir Putin, and therefore it's a it's a, a technical detail that should be ignored in looking at the facts of the case. The other day, you know, I had here at this uh, at this channel. 
a conversation with two Russian uh, economists. I assume, you know, at least one of them you know very well, Sergei Alexashenko, one of those central bankers in, in the Yeltsin's uh, Russia. And first he said that there are 260 billion in uh, so-called frozen money uh, in U.S. dollars so far. But that's the separate issue about, you know, the amount of money which got frozen after the war started. But he also said that it's impossible to do uh, it's impossible to do without any, you know, international court proceeding. Um, I mean, I, I don't think that that's that's the case. Uh, I mean, I think that again, this is ultimately not a legal issue. This is a political issue. Um, uh, the, at the end of the and day, in this case, I'm sorry, Bill. They immediately, you know, people say, "Yes, of course, Bill Browder is a grandson of Earl Browder, the one of the uh, founding fathers of the Communist Party of the United States, and that you know you'd be trying to behave the way commissars behaved back in 1917 when you know they nationalized all Zara's uh, gold and all assets exist of the foreign companies existed in then Zarist Russia. Well, pe people can make whatever, um, I mean, I, I, I've been called many names um, in many different contexts by, by people from Russia. They've called me a CIA agent. They've called me an MI6 agent. They've called me an international financial swindler. They've called me a murderer. Um, and so uh, to call me a communist commissar um, doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, what matters here is that Russia has committed a grave crime in Ukraine, killing many, many tens, if not hundreds of thousands of Ukrainians, um, causing unbelievable hardship, damage, terrorism, um, and Russia has to pay for it. And, um, and I don't think that anyone looking at this thing objectively can say that Russia's, R Russia should be protected by law when Russia is violating the law in such a dramatic <clears throat> and heartless way. And so, um, you know, you people call me whatever they want. This is not about me. This is about justice and it's about Ukraine. They also say that it's all about revenge. I would remind to our uh, listeners that Bill Browder authored two bestsellers, one of which, Red Notice, was translated in Russian, not in Russia, in Ukraine, and we in the New Times, we publish uh, one or two chapters, you know, but it's, uh, once again, you know, you can read this book in Russian. Uh, of course, you know, you can read it all around the globe in English. But so people say that you have very uh, bad, uh, uh, bad relationship with the Russian government. Russian government kicked you out. You lost your visa. They tried to steal a big part of your business. Uh, they killed uh, Sergei Magnitsky. You had to basically move the office of Hermitage Capital from Moscow to London. And you had a lot of, you know, losses. So how would you respond to that? Well, I think um, revenge is, is, is sort of a dirty word. I would say that, that for the last uh, 15 years since Sergei Magnitsky was murdered, I've been trying to seek justice. Justice is different than revenge. And, um, and in that regard, um, I've spent a long time working with lawmakers around the world to get the Magnitsky Act in place, which, which is not true justice, but, but uh, closer to justice than total impunity. Um, and as far as the, uh, what I'm trying to do for Ukraine, uh, I think everybody woke up on February 24th, um, 2022 in a state of shock. And, and the moment that the shock, uh, you recovered from the shock and you, and you looked at these terrible images of bombers and tanks and all this kind of stuff, every, every, there wasn't a, a, a normal, a, a person with any normal values in the world that didn't say, what can I do to help? And that's how I felt. Um, and, and I wanted to help. I, I wanted to help the Ukrainians in any way I could because I felt their pain. And, um, and the one way I can, can help is I, I've spent the last 14 years running around the world um, trying to come up with legislation to freeze Russian assets. That skill set uh, should be very helpful in, in, in moving from just freezing to seizing. And, and, and uh, 
and that's why I'm doing it. And 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 I continue to be shocked and upset by what's happening, and watching every day as more Ukrainians who did nothing other than just want to live a normal life are being bombed and killed in separate terrorist incidents that are terrorist terrorism organized by Vladimir Putin. Just yesterday, people were killed in Kiev because of the Russian bombing. People were killed in Kharkiv because of the Russian bombing. Part of the reason that people were killed in Kiev was that uh, Ukraine uh, is, uh, is, has been lacking uh, patriots, uh, missiles, you know, necessary weapons to defend their skies. We all know that the United States Congress, and you've been, you know, you're a citizen of the United States as well as the citizen of the United Kingdom, uh, doesn't allow for these weapons to get to Ukraine. What's going on? Why the United States is in favor of uh, Ukraine losing this war? As it seems, as some people say, you know, watching what's going on in the U.S. Congress. Well, I, I don't think the United States as a country wants Ukraine to lose the war. Um, but 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 I do think that there are certain individuals in in the U.S. House of Representatives um, that want Ukraine to lose the war. They want Putin to win the war. These are people uh, in the far right of the Republican Party. They call it the MAGA wing, the Make America Great wing of the Republican Party. And these people are are highly sympathetic to Putin. And so far, they've been able um, uh, to tie up. Uh, the aid, the military aid and financial aid to Ukraine successfully. It should have happened two months ago, and it's still tied up. My prediction, for what it's worth, is that there will be a compromise. What we do know for sure is that President Biden wants the money to be provided to Ukraine. And I know many people on both sides of the aisle, and Democrats and Republicans in the Senate, who want the money to be uh, provided to Ukraine. And, and the key is just for the lawmakers in Washington to find a way, a negotiated way to get this money to them. And so and different people in Washington are now throwing all sorts of obstacles in the way, trying to get things done that they couldn't get done before in the hope that there's such a desire for the U.S. to support Ukraine that, that things that they were hoping, in, for example, in border security and other things will get done. And um, uh, I think it will get done, but it, it is very unfortunate. And, and in the meantime, as, as you say, Ukrainians are dying because of, of politicians um, in Washington uh, and certain specific politicians that are playing games. There is the leader of MAGA, Make America Great Again, who is about to become a nominee as a candidate from the, uh, as, as a nominee from the Republican Party for uh, the President of the United States. He may become a President of the United States next November. At least, you know, the, you know, the odds are pretty high. Is it to say, and, you know, and as you well aware, Donald Trump said that he was going to resolve the, uh, the European uh, war conflict in a matter of 24 hours. The only way to do it is to pressure Ukraine to get on its knees and to plead to Putin, please stop killing us, take whatever you want. So basically it is to say that the possible president of the United States is going to support Putin in his war against Ukraine. What is your reflection to that? It's, a, it's an absolutely terrible, horrifying, um, thought. And if that were to happen, I think uh, it could lead to unbelievable problems. First of all, I should say that there is no negotiated settlement. <clears throat> Even if Zelensky were to capitulate, what, what it would mean is that um, Putin would win in Ukraine, but I don't think he has any intention of stopping there. I think Putin would probably very much like to test whether NATO is a real uh, defense organization or not. I can imagine that if Putin wins in Ukraine, he'll then try something out in Estonia or Lithuania or Latvia. And then he'll wanna see um, whether the America or the United Kingdom or various other countries are ready to go to war with Russia over a country of one or two million people. Are they? 
Well, I, I think that uh, Trump isn't. Trump is, was ready to withdraw from NATO before any of this stuff happened. And then the question is, would anyone in Europe um, want to put their own young men in harm's way to die um, uh, for a NATO treaty? And I think that Putin's fantasy would be that NATO falls apart. And if that were to happen, um, then he could take whatever he wants. And, and that's why this support for Ukraine is so vital right now. Then, you know, it's really, you know, perplexing to people like me to watch what's happening here in the United States uh, Congress. And one of the school of thought is that, that uh, in fact, United States of America, you know, some uh, important people in the U.S. government, they would they the reason why they don't push for giving ukrainians you know f-16 to close the sky so to give them more patriots or to give an attack on so that ukraine can defend it, uh, itself from uh russian drones and missiles located in crimea peninsula and etc cetera, etc cetera, which also of course you know crimean peninsula was occupied by putin back in 2014. so one of the school thought is that Americans are trying to sort of to bleed Russia, to try to uh, uh, to push Putin to use as much resources as possible, as much industrial power as possible, uh, to you know sort of to uh, to destroy all that, to bring it all to the Ukrainian front lines and to weaken Russia as much as possible in the cause of the war. What do you think about the school of thought? <clears throat> well, I, I think that that's been one of the consequences of the policy so far is, is that, um, well, first of all, everybody expected Russia was going to win in three days. Russia didn't. And then as, as the war dragged on, I think everybody in the West, um, uh, and certainly in, in Western defense establishment, have marveled at how bad Russia was at executing their invasion. And, and we're also very pleased with the loss of Russian military equipment and infrastructure and soldiers and so on, because as you say, it weakens a very important adversary. But I wouldn't say that that was by design. I think that that was um, the result. I, I, I've seen these people, I've spoken to these people, and what I've seen is that their approach to this war was very simple, that absolutely the United States and the UK and, and everybody else absolutely didn't want Russia to win. There was no question about that. And they wanted to provide Ukraine with weapons so Russia didn't win. And they provided Ukraine with enough weapons so Russia didn't win, and it was successful. But they didn't provide Ukraine with enough weapons so that Ukraine could win. And why didn't they do that? And the answer is, and this was very conscious, and I think this comes back to intent, the, what, what the real intent was, is that they were scared. Jake Sullivan and, and uh, Blinken and all these other US leaders um, who were advising Biden, they were scared. And they, they even said so. They were scared that what would, what would Putin do if Ukraine won? They were scared of what they called escalation. They were afraid that Putin would like set off a nuclear bomb or something terrible. And they didn't want on their watch while they were in their jobs to be the person responsible for, per, quote, provoking Putin to doing something crazy. And so the easy way to avoid that <clears throat> was just to slow, slow walk the weapons, give the weapons, but not enough weapons so that they could achieve one objective, stopping the Russians, but not achieving the second objective. But in the process, we've seen very clearly the Russians burning through all their men. I believe, according to Ukrainian numbers today, Russia has lost 371,000 soldiers. Um, we, we've seen that, that the tank, the, the supply of tanks that Russia has available to it has dropped by 95%. Um, all sorts of other uh, parts of the military uh, infrastructure have been uh, destroyed. And, and, we, and we know that for sure because the Russian government is now um, effectively begging North Korea and Iran for weapons. Um, and, and so I, I, don't, I don't think that the, that the West was as cynical as, as you 
presented it. I think it was it was more a result of that. But here we are now. Russia has now been degraded by a, a dramatic uh, extent. But to uh, for Ukraine to win, it's not going to happen unless they have the money and the military support, which hasn't been forthcoming as of now. Your opponents will say, uh, one, Putin couldn't care less how many men have died or are going to die. So, yep. yes, you know, there are more than at least 300,000 people who are already dead or wounded and etc. That's number one. Number two, Putin managed to buy the loyalty of its of mothers and wives and sisters of those who are serving as a cannon fodder at the, at the Ukrainian front with money and with very big money. These people are making, you know, 10 times what they were making monthly or yearly before the war. So uh, the war has become some sort of a social lift for the, the poorest of the poorest in Russia. And let's give him a credit, Putin is smart. Number two. Number three, people will tell you that Putin has managed to back the Soviet military industrial complex back on track. And a lot of supplies, those chips, for instance, who are so necessary to produce, you know, calibers, you know, Iskanders and other uh, uh, Russian missiles, which kill people in Ukraine as we speak. These parts are coming from the United States of America, from Germany, and so it goes through the th third uh, uh, countries, and of course, the China is involved. So there are, you know, people would say, look, you know, Putin is uh, using uh, the Western greed and the Western weakness and its inability to put uh, your morals before Bach, and that's why he's winning. Isn't that true? Well, first of all, let, let, me, let me challenge the last words you said. He's not winning. He's just not, he, 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 there's a stalemate. He's definitely not winning. Um, but, but a lot he of those- 20% of Ukrainian territory are occupied. That's that, that based on his, his objectives since the start of this war, that is not winning. He is, he's absolutely not winning. And I don't think anyone can categorize it as a win, but you're right about all these things. So you're right that Putin doesn't care about how many men he loses. Um, I think you're partially right about him buying off um, the families, but I don't think that that's entirely the case. I think that, that um, uh, you know, the, 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 the mothers in the Soviet Union were the ones who stopped the Afghan war from from happening and precisely because soviets didn't care to give them a buck well yeah but th there was only fifteen thousand dead there we're now talking about 20 times as much here and and bucks or no bucks you know there's a lot of a lot of mothers wives children friends um i mean it's it's this is i i don't think that 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 properly explains it. I think that what explains the lack of civil unrest in Russia right now is the fact that everybody is petrified. Putin uses the carrot, which you've just described very articulately, and he uses the stick, which is that if anyone peeps a word, then they end up going to jail or dying. And we've seen, of course, many people we know sitting in jail in Russia. And so I think that Putin is running it not not with a carrot, but he's, I think it's a total repressive regime. And that's what keeps order in place so far. Um, and then, and then as, in terms of, of uh, can he carry on? I think he can carry on for a long time. And the one thing you didn't mention um, is oil, that people continue to buy Russian oil. The oil continues to fund um, the purchase of weapons and and the support of the military complex. And as long as Russia can sell its oil, um, Russia will have money to carry on this war into perpetuity. And I think that's the real problem, is that if, if we wanna st stop this war, we have to starve Putin of the financial resources. And at the moment, we're too greedy and too scared to do an oil embargo, Russian oil embargo.
And that would actually have the effect that we were looking for. And so we're stuck. And in and, and the meantime, Putin carries on. Time is on his side. As you say, he doesn't care about dead bodies and he's got money flowing in. And time isn't on our side because we have Donald Trump looming in the future. We have the Hungarians blocking EU aid packages. We have the MAGA uh, right wing blocking US aid packages. And we live in democracies where things can change from month to month and year to year. We have a bunch of different elections coming up. We have a European election this year. We have a British election. We have, of course, the US election. And there could be a completely different attitude next year, this year. And so Putin is just buying time and, 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 and he doesn't feel the pain that everyone else feels. And so the only question is, um, is there going to be a moment when the pressure cooker in Russia overflows that people where that where where the um, where people just stop caring with, with that, that they stop caring about their fear because they're all the, the dying on the front is is as likely as dying in a Russian prison. <clears throat> and what I would say is, is that at any moment. Something could happen or it may never happen, um, but. Uh, Putin has made a, a life miserable for many, many, many people in Russia. And, and you can see little, little signs of this in, in Ufa. Um, uh, uh, a couple of days ago, all sorts of people rose up and- uh, You mean in, the, in Bashkirtostan, it wasn't exactly, uh, in Bashkirtostan. It's true, it's also, we can see that, you know, uh, there are, you know, these funny, funny elections, uh, presidential elections are coming and people are standing in line to put their signature in favor of somebody who is speaking against the war. He might not be you know, a real opponent to Putin, but he's still speaking against the war and the was all across the country. But there is a, unfortunately, you know, some reality. And the reality is that Ukraine was a country of 44 million before the start of this awful war. And now it's a country of 27 million and maybe even less. And they're losing, they don't have enough manpower. And that's what Russians are going to tell you. Ukrainian um, losing, doesn't have enough manpower, doesn't have enough resources, it's, it's cannot produce its own weapons. You know, it's, you know, it has a three, uh, $30 billion budget deficit, deficit and so on and so it goes. And Russia, keep, Putin keeps destroying its infrastructure, its cities, its elevators. The East industry, as you're well aware, in the East, totally destroyed. In that respect, Ukraine is totally de-industrialized country. So all, all, all that's true. But the one thing I should tell you, and, and I think you know this, is that um, don't ever count the Ukrainians out. And, and there's a very simple reason for that, because if, if they were to lose, if Ukraine were to lose, what happens? Bucha happens, you know, be, uh, women gang raped, men having their testicles cut off, castration, children being kidnapped. And so if you're faced with that as a reality, um, you're gonna fight and you're gonna fight industriously and you're gonna fight in every possible way because the uh, alternative is so horrifying. A Russian occupation is so unbelievably bad. And, and so the Ukrainians, whether they get the money or not, will continue fighting. And the Ukrainians are very industrious, as we saw at the very beginning of the war, where they didn't have anything. And so um, I think it's, it's a very big, big statement to think that, that um, Putin can win. What he can do is create a, a, an ugly, frozen conflict. And, um, and that's effectively what we have right now. And, and, and some I, Europeans are arguing in favor of those uh, frozen con and not just Europeans, as you're well aware. Well, the Europeans can argue whatever they want. They're not the ones on the ground whose wives and daughters are going to be raped if the Russians come, come and take over. And that's going to be the Ukrainians. And that's why the Ukrainians are fighting so hard. Okay, so you don't think that, you know, any... Because just recently, uh, we saw that Putin or some people in his administration uh, have been sending envoys uh, to different, uh, to the United States and to Great Britain, to other European countries, arguing in favor of ceasefire, arguing that it's in the interest of Ukraine to get a ceasefire now, because three months from now, I'm, this is a quote, because one of those envoys met with me personally in New York City. And the argument was, 
if Zelensky refuses to go for the ceasefire now, then in three months it, it's going to be worse, and in six months it's going to be much worse. And we assume that by saying much worse, they mean uh, occupation of Kharkiv and destroying Odessa. Well, so I, I, I think this whole, this whole um, ceasefire diplomacy is just a complete trick. I, I don't think that there's, Putin has any intention of a ceasefire. I don't think he has any intention of a compromise. I think that this is a trick and it's a very clever trick if you go around and, and you have these conversations, it gets reported. And it was reported a few weeks ago in the New York Times. And so now you've got a report in the New York Times saying that the Russians have an effort to um, negotiate a settlement. And that report um, in the New York Times is, is happening concurrently with a debate in Congress about whether to supply more money to Ukraine. And so the obvious logic for somebody in Congress is, well, maybe we should wait until, uh, until this ceasefire thing is resolved before we supply the money. And so I, I've, I've been in, a, in many conflicts in Russia, and this is a standard Russian disinformation trick, um, when in a, in, in a, and particularly when there's a negotiation going on. There's, Putin has absolutely no intention of ceasefiring. His whole grip on power is to be pummeling Ukraine. He's got to look like the strong man. He, if the moment there's a ceasefire, he looks like a weak person, and that's not that. That's absolutely not in his interest. And he's going to get killed by his own entourage. But I would, I would suggest, I, I would think. Uh, the last question, if I may, uh, you mentioned about uh, those uh, Russian political prisoners who are sitting in jails. Alexei Navalny is now beyond the Arctic Circle. You know, nineteen years in you know the harsh maximum security prison, once again in the solitary confinement, no communication, just totally cut off of any communication. The same problem with Vladimir Karamuza, who is in uh, Siberia, in Omsk, 25 years for treason that, you know, I mean, obviously it was all fake. So Ilya Yashin and many others. I know that you're trying to uh, argue, the, uh, you are trying to help uh, uh, at least, you know, Vladimir Karamurza. Vladimir Karamurza was instrumental, as far as I understand, in promoting Magnitsky Act. He was an adherent of this act. And uh, those who put him in prison, put him in prison precisely because he managed, he helped to put those judges and those procurators and those investigators on the uh, Magnitsky list, which didn't allow them to travel to Europe, which they love very much to travel yeah. to. Yeah. Now, what are the possibilities to uh, to get Vladimir Karmusa out? Why we don't see Americans or British goodwill people, human rights, saying, let these people go? Well, I mean, I, this is one of my main, this is, this is, I would say, my most important objective and priority. Vladimir is a close friend and not just Vladimir, but the other ones, Ilya Yashin and, and uh, all, all of the political prisoners. And, and what I'd like to organize is, is something which has happened historically, which is the West has been able to um, free Russian political prisoners, Nathan Sharansky, Vladimir Bukovsky, many other prisoners. And, and so I, I've, I was just in Davos last week and I was meeting with all, all um, European foreign ministers with a specific proposal that, that there should be a project to free the Russian political prisoners, to find to find some Russian spies that are held in the West and do a big bridge of spies prisoner swap um, uh, like has been done in the past. I think that um, uh, for most of the political prisoners, I don't think Putin really cares that much. I think that, that I mean, he, he doesn't like them, but I think that uh, he'd probably want to get back some of his own spies. And so that's my hope and my objective and, and something that I'm working on and, and I'm hoping to make more progress on that. It's, it's a hard, I think, it, I think this is harder than, than, uh, than the 300 billion. I think the 300 billion is an easier, uh, easier project than getting the political prisoners free, but we, it's, it's really important. And, and, and I don't think that uh, Vladimir Karamurza will survive um, uh, 25 years. I don't think he'll even survive five years. And so it's urgent and important that we get him out. Yes, doctors say that he probably uh, managed uh, to stay for maybe uh, 
uh, 18 months, maybe 24 months, but no longer than that. His uh, health is rapidly declining and we need to get him out now. Yeah, yeah it's it's um, absolutely crucial. They tried to kill him twice with poison. The after effects of poison are having a very bad uh, impact on his life. He's sitting in solitary confinement in Omsk in what they call strict regime. He's able to get one hour of exercise a day. He, he's, uh, uh, he has to sit in this cell staring at the wall. It's just inhuman what they're doing to him. And they're doing it to him uh, because he was one of the leaders of the opposition who got the Magnitsky Act passed and implemented. And he's one of the few people that was brave enough to stand up to Putin. And everyone's heard of Alexei Navalny, but um, Vladimir Karamurza is equally important and equally brave and, and deserves the attention of the West. Bill Browder, thank you very much for caring about our own political prisoners. And uh, thank you very much for your fight. And let's hope that you will succeed on all those fronts. Bill Browder, CEO of Herb and Touch Capital uh, Management and head of the Global Magnitsky Campaign, author of the bestseller, The Red Notice, and uh, some other books. And uh, thank you very much for giving this interview to Paul Nelbats. Thank you. Goodbye.